I'm like, uh, Rick's up here, and I'm, I'm giving Sean a hard time, and she said, I didn't have any clean clothes. Will you turn me down just a little bit, Joe? That's kind of loud. She said she didn't have any clean clothes, and then she pointed at Rick and said, he's the laundry guy. He's been slacking. I just, listen, I had to turn the other way. <laughs> I mean, what do you do about that? Right? I just said, Rick, don't talk to my wife. Uh, <laughs> right? Easy enough. Uh, actually, our little girl has started doing laundry, and uh, like she's on top of it. Like we ain't got no clothes. No clean clothes, no dirty clothes. I think she's just throwing everything away. Uh, <laughs> But she, she came to me and she said, Dad, I've been doing laundry. Can I get paid? I said, when do you want paid? She said, well, I want paid now. I said, well, how much do you want paid? She said, well, if you're paying the boys $25, I need $26. <laughs> I said, see me June 1st. When is June 1st? It's three months away. Don't worry about it, honey. I'll let you know when it comes. <laughs> hey, spiritual warfare, here we go, right? Spiritual warfare. Hey, this morning, let me, let me be completely transparent. This morning, I walked up to my office and uh, was getting ready, and I was sitting there at the desk, and I stubbed my toe, and I'm like, man, that hurt right through my tennis shoes. And I looked down, and I had Crocs on. And I said, well, that's what they are today. That's what I'm going to wear. But anyone had a good week this week? Anyone had a rough week this week? Right? Anyone feel like the enemy's been kicking you in the teeth? Like, every time you turn around, he's like Bruce Lee kick, right? Like, I was good when it was like the, the little midget kick. You know, he hits you in the knee, you're okay. But now he's like Bruce Lee kick, Chuck Norris kick, and, and it kind of hurts. But, hey, guess what? It's going to get worse. Right? The Bible tells us it gets worse before it ever gets better. And we should be okay with that because our better is not here anymore. Right? Our better is in heaven. And as long as we're doing what we're supposed to, the enemy's going to attack you. So if you don't want the enemy to attack you, just sit sour and soak and you'll be fine. He won't do anything. Right? He doesn't care that you're a Christian. That doesn't bother him. He cares that you're fighting against him. So if you're going to continue to do things for God, the enemy's going to continue to attack you. Right? God doesn't want any sissies, no pansies. Right? He, he wants people that are going to stand up for him. So if you're going to stand up for God... Be prepared to be attacked. Just what it is. We're in war. Right? Our verse, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. The Bible says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. It's not against the person who cuts you off. Come on. I, I, I've seen some of you guys drive. You're the person cutting people off. Right? It's not against the person who cuts you off. It's not against the person when you're in the grocery store, right? And you're doing, minding your own business, you're getting stuff, and they crash into you. Like, I've never understood that. It's like, you didn't see me here, and you just, it's not against that person. It's not against the person that, you know, I, transparency. I hate, 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 I mean, I, I hate when people drive through the front of our yards up here. I just do. I mean, I struggle with that. And so this week we were here, and I looked up there, and right up here at the front of the property, an SUV just took off driving right across the front of the field. Like it's their home. It's a good thing it's like 700 feet from here to there because I'm you know, i winded by the time I get up there. Oh, hang on. No, it wasn't that bad, but I get up there, and I, it's like I want to fire away because it's like, what do you do? Give me your address and let me drive across your front yard, right? I mean, I, I have a four-wheel drive truck. I'll gladly put it in four-wheel drive and come across your front yard and pretend like I got stuck, right? It bothers me, and as I walked up there ready to rip their head off, you say, preacher, that's awful strong. It's just a yard. Let me drive across your front yard and see what you think, right? I mean, they just drive across it like it's whatever. They'll do whatever they want, and it just bothers me. And I'm up there, and I'm getting ready to unload. And I remember where I'm at, right? I, I remember the shirt that I'm wearing. I remember on the sign, right, 
my name's there, so I'm like, I'm going to introduce myself as Jose Avalos. <laughs> they call the office Jose Avalos. We don't have a Jose here. Who is that? Right? I didn't even know he was lying to me about his name until I called his voicemail and it said Jose. I'm like, I thought it was Joe. And so then I, I just, as nicely as I could muster at that moment, said, ma'am, ma'am, right? I mean, like, Bruce Lee kick. No, I was like, ma'am, if you would kindly park on the driveway... I mean, the people she was trying to see were coming that way anyways. It's like she's driving across the road, like, and almost going to run them over because they're coming her way anyways. Ma'am, if you could kindly park on the driveway. Well, I just saw them there, and I just had to talk to them. Ma'am, if you would kindly park on the driveway. You can park on the driveway for hours. I don't care. You can build a campfire. But park on the driveway. She offered me some Prozac and said, okay, I'll take care of that. <laughs> Listen, I, I have to remember as much as anyone that the battle that we fight is not against people. It's against spiritual rulers in dark places. How many of you got a Facebook account? How many think you should delete that Facebook account? How many of you are really going to do it? <laughs> Maybe one or two of you. The rest of you are a bunch of liars. We ain't deleting them. Right? I get on Facebook late at night so I can see what you're doing. Because some of you guys aren't smart enough not to check into places. I got on Facebook the other day and I, I'm looking and there's this pre I'm friends with a lot of preachers. And there's this preacher and he's talking about this other preacher who, who went to prison for molesting a child. And, and not a two-year-old child, but an indecent relationship. Um, and they begin to not talk about the man. They're destroying the, the character and saying the guy just got out of prison for 10 years and they shouldn't let him in a church. And there must have been, Ben, there must have been six or 700 people commenting on this post about, well, they should kill that guy. They should, if he ever shows up to their church, they should run him out. I mean, just all this stuff. And I'm like, Stay off the keyboard, just swipe and get past it, right? And I just kept going back. And my fingers got the same problem my mouth does, right? I just started saying stuff. And I just said, hey, don't you think, well, my first comment was, it, it's no wonder to me that people are leaving the church at such a rapid pace. Because the church, people, have gotten so holier than thou Right? That if you do something, they find out about it, you're not welcome anymore. And so someone fired back, keyboard warriors, right? They fired back. And then this preacher got on the post, the preacher who made the post. And, and I said, don't you think it'd be great, private message him, don't you think it'd be great if we loved the man but hated the sin? I mean, I, I think that's somewhere in the Bible. I think. Not, but don't you think it'd be... Well, you just don't understand that kind of person just needs to be have something thrown around their neck and thrown in the water and be done with them. I said, man, I think Jesus said this. He said, ye that are without sin, cast the first stone. You throw in rocks. Listen, it's easy for us to grab things, to gravitate towards things that we would think, man, we can't believe that. But let me tell you, it's by God's grace that you're not that. It's by God's grace that you are where you're at today and not where you used to be yesterday. Right? As I look around here, I know some of your stories. And you know, and you know some of mine. And it's by God's grace and God's grace alone that we're where we're, we're at. Right? We, we didn't get what we deserve. He gave us mercy. He gave us grace because... He understands that the fight is not against people. It's against principalities. Guys, at some point, we, the church, have to begin to understand that. We, the church, have to understand that we're not fighting against people. People make mistakes. People sin. People screw up. 
Anyone ever screwed up? All of you that didn't raise your hand are a bunch of liars. Listen, people screw up. It doesn't make that person any less valuable to Christ because of their screw up. And guys, when we, when we really drive that point home and we really begin to understand it's not the person, it's the action that we have the problem with, we'll be a whole lot closer to the New Testament church. I mean, listen, the New Testament church was started by a guy that was murdering Christians. You, you got that? I mean, we, we talk about this crime and that crime. The New Testament church, the church is at, at, at Ephesus. The guy that stood up to preach had just been killing people. They were able to separate the man from the action. We need to understand that we have to separate that man from the action. Let me ask a question. Do you really believe in the devil? Like, not the devil with the horns and the little tail. Not that guy. Okay, he doesn't exist. Not the devil as some religions might have you believe is Jesus' brother because Jesus got no brother. Okay? Not the devil who is on the same playing field, if you will. Somehow we've made this that the devil is on the same playing field as God. He's not. Okay? The devil's here and God's up here. But do you believe in the devil? Do you believe that the devil is a real being, that he is... Real, 100%, much like you and I. And listen, he's an eternal being. So the same devil that showed up in Genesis chapter 3, right? Remember him, the, the one that embodied the serpent, lied to the lady, got man to sin, that devil. Is the same devil that shows up in Revelation chapter 20 for the last time. And guess what? He's the same devil that warges, wages spiritual warfare against you and me. The greatest thing that new age, new age, right, the new age religions have ever done is try to make you believe that there's no devil. Like we, we often say, well, the devil made me do it, and the fact is you made yourself do it, right? The devil never made you do anything. He just dangled the carrot in front of you. You took the carrot, but new age religion, right, New Age philosophy says the devil doesn't really exist. He's just kind of a mythological creature, right? He was just the face of evil, if you will. Now, they believe in God, but don't really believe in the devil. You think the devil's happy about that? Man, he, he is so excited that people don't believe because if people don't believe in him, they won't try to stop him because he doesn't exist, right? Right? See, we the church have to remember that the devil is real. Okay, say the devil is real. Listen, he's real. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 tells us that he's roaring around like a lion, seeking whom he can devour. He doesn't want to play ball and fetch with you. He's not like Gabe, right, my Weimaraner. If, if you have a ball, you can throw a ball, and as long as you can throw it, Gabe will go get it. The devil doesn't want to play ball with you. He wants to eat you. He wants to destroy you. And listen, he'll destroy you in your marriage. He'll destroy you in your friendships. He'll destroy the church by using you. The devil's not here to play nice. He's here to destroy you. I've never seen a lion in real life outside of a zoo, right? I've seen him in the zoo, and that's pretty good for me. Don't need to see him anywhere else, right? It's like I don't go into salt water because they're sharks, and they could eat me. I'm not going. I'm not going to the Sahara Desert where lions roam around for free, right? I'm smart enough to know to stay away from something that's going to eat me. And I could be a meal and a half maybe. And I'm, I, I, listen, I'm not trying to be any kind of meal. But listen, how many of us... And I say us, how many of us flirt with the devil and do things of the devil because we don't think he can harm us? 
We, we even play in our minds that he's not as real as what he is, so we begin to flirt and do things that we don't need to do. I heard of a church, unfortunately a church, who, who let some people come in to open a portal, if you will, and they said the portal was to let heaven down. Listen, if you've got Jesus Christ in you, the Holy Spirit resides in you, heaven is down already, Amen. right? You go open in portals, you know what's coming through portals? Hell's coming up. Listen, we have to understand that the devil is real, and he'll use whatever trickery he can to convince you that he's not or to get you to do something that you shouldn't. TV shows, movies, right? And, and listen, we're, we're not tooting our own horn. We're not the best parents. We, we do all kinds of screwed up things. I'd give the mic to my kids, but we'd be here all day. But listen, the devil uses movies. He implants things in movies to get you to start to fall away. Music. I like good music, right? But the devil uses music to get you to... Why wouldn't he? He was the angel of music. He was the guy who sang for God. Why wouldn't he use music? Listen, the devil will use anything he can to derail you. And oftentimes, we walk right into it. Oftentimes, we... We act like he's not there. We know he's there, and we just don't think he can touch us. And he's like, perfect. Yeah, I, I like to watch YouTube videos. Anyone else like watching YouTube videos? Like, I, I like to watch those stupid people because it's like, you know, you know they're going to do something dumb. You can see it on the little thumbnail. And I'll watch 25 minutes to see two seconds of idiocracy, right? But I, I like to watch National Geographic YouTube videos, too, right? Because animals think they're smart. And I was watching a video one time that they, they were over by the Nile, I think, and the Nile River's covered in crocodiles. I mean, it's everywhere, right? And these animals are like, they want some water, but the crocodiles are at the water, so maybe I don't want the water. Well, one of them thinks they're brave, right? Hey, listen, it, this is probably you. One of them thinks they're brave. He sneaks down to the water. There's a crocodile right there. He looks at it. It looks at him. They just kind of stare off for a minute. Now, listen, that thing's got teeth. The animal, the dummy, right, steps into the water with his front legs. Now, Croc's right there. He's watching him. It's watching him. Then he does this. He goes... He ain't done nothing yet. Leans his head down to get some water. What do you think that crocodile did? Nah. Go ahead and have go ahead and get some water. I'm good with that. He snatched him up. I mean, you think flirting with sin that the devil ain't gonna do nothing. Well, it's just a little lie. That's all he needed. That's all he needed to get in. It's just a little lot. Well, I just skipped church just one time. And listen, I'm not saying church as is, is like, if you don't come to church, you can still go to heaven. Okay, you can. You go to heaven disobedient, but you can still go. Okay? Church is not part of salvation. The gathering of the church is not part of salvation. But you should be there because it helps to strengthen you. I mean, what do you think those other antelopes are thinking of this guy? I mean, they're all squawking. I don't understand antelope, but I'm sure they're saying, hey, idiot, there are crocs down there. Hey, dummy, don't go. And listen, you know what? I can always tell when people are falling into sin. It's easy, Adam. It's, and Adam's not falling into sin. I'm just using Adam right now. <laughs> hey, did you know Adam's falling into sin? They'll call me later. <laughs> hey, it's, it's easy, though. Do you know how? They quit calling. They quit coming around. You don't talk. We got a friend like that, don't we? Quits calling. Doesn't come around. I mean, it was, was as much a fixture here as this chair is. Quit calling. Quit coming around. I stopped to see a friend of ours. Lives over there by you yesterday. Hadn't seen her in forever. Her husband called. I picked the phone up. Right? 
My question would be, why is some guy answering my wife's phone, right? I mean, that'd be my question. He's like, who is this? Man, you don't know my voice? How long you been gone? They quit coming. They fell into sin. They're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Because we get ashamed. So we're ashamed of it, so we hide from it. Listen, you can hide from me all day long, but you can't play hide and seek with Jesus. He wins every time. The devil wants you to start hiding. He wants you to tiptoe around sin. Listen, I don't think if you drink alcohol, I don't think you're going to hell. I don't think if you smoke, you're going to hell. I think you'll smell like you've been to hell if you smoke, but I don't think you're going. I don't think if you drink, you're going to hell. I can take the Bible. I can prove it even. Okay? But I can tell when you're doing it too much. I can tell when you begin to go to places that you shouldn't go to because you quit coming. You quit answering. You quit calling and saying, hey, preacher. We do those things because we're ashamed because the enemy got you. I'm not a fisherman. Adam likes to fish. I don't know why, but he likes it. Joe likes to fish. Joe's no good at it, though. I don't know that Adam's any good either, but, you know, whatever. I know enough about fishing to know this. Ben, do you like to fish? You like to try. At least you're honest about it. Okay. <laughs> I know enough about fishing to know this, that you don't go out, pitch your pole out with the hook on it with nothing on the hook, right, and drop it in the water and just sit there like a dummy and wait for it to bite. I put something on the hook, throw it out there, let him eat it off the hook, and then sit there like a dummy waiting on him to bite. But you put bait on there, right, that looks appealing, looks appetizing, and they begin to nibble at it. Just a nibble here, a nibble there. And then what happens? Whoa! They got it. Your pole bends over. You're reeling for all your worth. You pull up a one-pound fish. It's true. I mean, that's what happens every time you think you've got a giant on there. It's a one-pound fish. But listen, all the devil needs you to do is start nibbling. Because once he sinks the hook, he's got you. And he'll drag you away from the church. Why do we gather? Why did the writer of Hebrews say not to forsake the gathering because we gain strength when we gather? I don't eat fish. I like to fish, not stand on the bank and fish because that's really boring. Uh, I like to go deep sea fishing. I love it, right? I like to go fishing for dolphin, mahi-mahi. It's great, right? It's a bloodbath, and they're coming, but, man, it's awesome. I don't want to eat any of it. I don't care about any of that. I just want to catch them, right? And I learned this the first time I ever went dolphin fishing. When you're fishing and you've got, someone on the, got one on the hook, you leave it on the hook, until you get another one on the hook, and then you pull that one up. And then you throw back in, you get another one on the hook, you pull this one up. And that's what you do. And the moment you pull it up and you ain't got nothing on the hook, one of the dolphins is pretty smart, says, hey, guys, let's get out of here because Joe, Bob, and Jack are gone. And they bail because there's strength in numbers. Why do you think God created the church as a family because there's strength in numbers. You know, I don't know anyone who goes to war all by themselves. Right? When you go to war, you want someone to watch your left side, your right side, your back side. You want to make sure they're there. So if you're out of church, well, you're disobedient because the enemy is whipping your tail because you ain't got no one watching your left side, your right side, your back side. We all got blind sides, right? I mean, I've seen some of you drive again. Remember that. You have a blind side. Jordan, you keep looking back at your dad like that's him or her. Are you looking at your dad or your mom? Mom. I've seen her drive too. I got a video of her. Yeah, you want me to show you? We'll put the video up right up there. Yeah, running that red light. Ooh, right through. It wasn't red. 25 seconds before she went through it. Listen, we have people around us to help us prevent ourselves from being blindsided by the enemy. People can see into your situation and see the whole gamut 
better than what you can if you're standing in the situation. They just can't, and, and I, don't, I don't really understand why, but it happens that way. Like, I'm really good at helping other people fix their problem, but I can't raise a kid at all. Like, I got a 60-year-old son that I'm telling you, if he keeps it up, I'm going to rock orange and white. And, and, like, I can help you with your 16-year-old kid and help you figure out how to diagnose it and fix it. But I go to Joe all the time and say, Joe, I don't know what is wrong with this kid. Well, which kid? Mine! People outside the gamut can see and help you if you're willing to accept the advice. That's why God created the church. That's why he created a family, right? Families love each other. Families want to help each other. But, hey, families most of all should be truthful with each other. They should be truthful with each other. Again, we're not fighting against each other. We're fighting against principalities, spiritual battles, right? And if a family member can see something, a road that you're on, and you're headed down the wrong road, and they know that road leads to disaster because they've been on it, and they come into you trying to help you, you should listen. Right? I mean, you should listen to them a little bit. Paul says this. He says that we should put on the armor of God to help us get through this. So last week I told you we're going to go through the armor of God. We're going to go through because next week we're going to talk about strongholds. Right? Next week we're going to talk about things that you have in your life that the enemy is using in this spiritual war against you. This week we're going to talk about things you need to put on to help prevent the enemy from using these things. Okay? So number one, if you'll turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, if you're not already there, you should turn there. If you don't have a Bible, my wife would say, raise your hand. We will get you a Bible. She'll just walk into my office and get one of the 700 that I have. you got 700 of your own. Okay. Joe trying to get another Bible. Andy, did you see that? He raised his hand. I need a Bible. I need a Bible. Where are your Bibles? You guys ain't got Bibles? Oh, your Bible's in the youth room. It's helping you here, ain't it? What about your 12? Where are yours? Where are that? Youth room. Yours? Youth room. You can't even read a Bible. Don't worry about it. <laughs> youth room, Joe. Who's the youth pastor? Is he the guy that just said he needed a Bible? He just said he needed a Bible. All right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, ready? Uh, verse 14, stand therefore with the truth like a belt around your waist. Listen, belts are important. You know why belts are important? Because they keep your pants up. Did you know when people made blue jeans, they put little loops on blue jeans? Do you know what those little loops are for? A belt. You got that, boy? Matthew, you got that? You got a belt on? Man, you can hear a, a mouse fart right now. You got so quiet. You got nothing. Listen, belts are to keep your pants up. We should, I'm, drive by the church later this week. Look at the sign. That's all I'm going to say. Look at the sign later this week. Now, just look at the sign. All right. With a truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor. We're going to go through these, okay? I just want to read them all. Righteousness like armor on your chest and your feet sandaled, not with Crocs, uh, but re with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of armor or the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I got swords, Ben. I got switchblades. I got little Bibles, right? I got lightsabers. I got the Bible on my phone. Listen, it's important to have a Bible. It's important to have a Bible. It's important to have a Bible. Guess what? Man, you guys are quick. Listen, you should have a Bible. When you come to church, I put it on the screen, right? Because there's people that are going to come that may not have a Bible. But if you've got a Bible 
and it's sitting at home, and the FBI can use it for fingerprints to help find you when you show up lost. There's a problem. You should have a Bible. When you come to gather with the church, look at that. John went to go get Bibles for the kids. You skipped that first one. He can't read. <laughs> he can read. We checked him. Listen, you should have a Bible so that you can make sure that what I'm telling you is legit. You ever watch the news and had them lie to you? Like if you watched the news last night, they probably lied. Right? You ever read a newspaper article and watched them lie to you in the newspaper article? Yes. You ever stood up and listened to a preacher talk and caught him lying about a Bible verse? Not if you ain't got no Bible, you didn't. Listen, you should have a Bible to make sure that you know what I'm saying is legit. I've threatened for years not to put it on the screen. But my eyes have gotten worse for years and I can read it up there better than I can right here. I went to the eye doctor this week and he said, Yep, pastor, you wearing those glasses all the time? I said, yeah, all the time. I'll, I'll trip if I ain't got them on. He's like, it's a good thing we're going to up your prescription because you need them. Listen, I put it up here so it's easier for me and hopefully easier for you to use. But you should have your own copy. And I mean this completely honestly. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, I will buy you a copy of the Word of God. I'm not giving you one of mine. I, I, you know, I just keep getting them. I like them. I got an addiction to Bibles. I used to have an addiction to other stuff. Now it's the Bibles. It's okay. Listen, if you don't have a copy of the Word of God, then you should get a copy of the Word of God. You need to have one. Okay, if you don't have one, let me know. I'll get you one. Let's, let's go back, sir. You're going to you're gonna have to chill. I got the mic right now. It's my turn to talk. Deal? All right. Number one. The belt of truth. Belts hold your pants up. Soldiers had belts because they needed to be able to move quickly. And without a belt, their pants fell down. Make sense? Makes sense. You should have a belt on to make sure that you can move quickly. To make sure that you can do what you need to do. And Paul, would you come up here? Thanks. You can disagree from the back row. But you can't disagree right here. Fair enough? Go ahead. Without a belt, soldiers couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he couldn't fight. Hang on. Hang on, Paul. Hang on. Hang on. Watch this. We're in spiritual battle. And by the name of Jesus Christ, you rebuke. By the name of Jesus Christ, get out. You have no place here. You have no place here. By the name of Jesus, take him out back. It's okay. Hey, that's a, they disrupted Jesus too. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to keep going. We need the belt of truth. We need to know what we're saying is legit. We need to know that what we're doing is real. And listen, you, if you go into battle without a belt on... Your pants are coming down. Like, I see these kids. Uh, listen, I see adults, not just kids, right? But I see adults, and they're running around with their pants down to their knees, Ben. And I'm thinking, and they're running that mouth, too, just as much, ain't they? And I'm thinking, you dummy, all I'm going to do is step on your pants. I'm, uh, they're going to run from the cops like this. I've seen it too. Yeah, I mean, they're running from the cops. Got one leg like. <laughs> Come on, church. We got the enemy attacking. How would we look if we, we going into battle to fight with him? We say, wait. All right, I got to hold my pants though with this one hand. I mean, you get in a fist fight and you got to hold your pants with one hand and fight with the other hand. You deserve to have your butt kicked. Listen. It's called the belt of truth for a reason. It's called the belt of truth because 
when the war starts, you can go back to what you know to be true. When the enemy attacks you, you should be able to go back to what you know is true. What is true? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he, God loved me. Romans 5, 8. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. 2 Corinthians. When God saved me, he made me brand new. Old things, have, I'm not what I used to be. Thank God. I'm, I'm, thank God. When the enemy attacks, if I don't know these things to be true, and he starts telling me, hey, you're a wash up, no good, yada, 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 yada. And you don't know that God has redeemed you. You don't know that God has restored you. He's washed you. He's made you new. And you don't know that. No wonder you're found in a corner sucking on your thumb. It's called the belt of truth for a reason. Listen, it prepares you for battle. When, the in, when, I didn't say if, when the enemy attacks, when the enemy attacks, and listen, this man right here is no different than any one of you. The enemy can use you just the same as he did him. When the enemy attacks, if you don't know the truth, you're going to fall for it. What, I mean, what, what that old country singer say? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. If you don't know the truth about something, you'll fall for the, for the mirage. Satan doesn't come in. He's like, well, here's the truth and here's the lie. They're not that far apart. Here's the truth. And here's the lie. They're close. Listen, if you don't know the truth, you're going to end up in a church with a limp wristed sissy preacher that's going to stand up there and lie to you and tell you that God's all about love. God would never send anyone to hell. And let's kumbaya and we'll roast some marshmallows. That's not God. God sent his son to die for you. That if you would accept him, you'd be saved for all of eternity. But if you reject him, you're already condemned. God didn't condemn you. You condemned yourself by rejecting the only son of God. That's the truth. The enemy will come and say, hey, God doesn't want someone like you. God, does. But if you know the truth, that's not true. Because God said, all those who call upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. That's the truth. And listen, if you're walking around without a belt on, you need to get a belt on. You got loops. Christian pants got loops. Okay, They ain't jogging pants. Right? God's not sending us to war out there in sweatpants. He's sending us to war out there in pants that got loops. You're supposed to have a belt on. The belt of truth. Have it on. Be prepared when the enemy attacks. Because he's coming. He's com and he'll use anybody. He'll use anything. Whatever he can do, he'll do to derail you. Number two, the Bible said the breastplate of righteousness. Listen, how would you look if like you, you headed to the war zone, right? And you're supposed to have your Kevlar vest on. It's bulletproof. Now, it don't stop all bullets, obviously. But it stops a lot of bullets, right? How would you look if you said, well, I'm going to go into war. And I'm going to go into war without the vest. I'm just going in. You know, I think I'm Superman. I'm just going in. And listen, you are superhuman until God decides otherwise. Okay? When God decides it's your time to go, you're going. But listen, you ain't got to be an idiot and step out in the middle of 41 and say stop to the next Mack truck. Because you can be an idiot laid in a hospital bed too. God said put on the breastplate of righteousness. To put on your vest, if you will. Put it on because there's a purpose. So I've got my Kevlar vest on, my, my bulletproof vest, if you will. The soldiers would put this vest on because, well, they weren't fighting against bullets back then, right? They were fighting against spears and swords and stuff like that. They put this vest on because it provided some protection for them. Paul says, as he's talking about the righteousness, he's talking about the righteousness that comes from Jesus 
that has been imparted upon you. Listen, you can't put a vest on if you ain't living right with Jesus. You hear me? You can't put on the righteousness of Christ if you're not living the way you're supposed to be living. Because you're ashamed of it. We just talked about that. Paul is saying put on the righteousness of Christ because you're standing before God and he's looking upon you and he sees his son. Get your life fixed. If you're doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing. Now, come on. If you're doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing. Paul's saying here, hey, you're going into battle without your vest on. You're leaving yourself wide open for the enemy to attack. You know the thing about vests, they don't just cover the front. Right? Cover the side. Cover your back. And the righteousness of Christ, when it's poured upon you in his blood, covered you. Right? But you can get caught up in sin and get distanced from him. And then you're out there in a battle without your vest on. Because you're not in right standing with God. You put something in between you. I'm just telling you guys that when you watch the SWAT team, sometimes you see them around Bradenton. Right? You see these guys hanging off of this this uh, military vehicle, and they're riding down, they say SWAT, right? And, man, they all decked out, Joe. I mean, you ain't, you ain't knocking them out with a slingshot, right? I mean, they got bulletproof vests on. I mean, they must be carrying 70 or 80 pounds worth of stuff. And, but it's all on, and the reason they put it on is to protect themselves against people in blind spots that they don't know are there. Listen, if you're fighting Ben and Ben's standing dead in front of you, okay. But, listen, you ain't fighting Ben, you fighting someone that's got lots of people to help him. So if the enemy's in front of you and the guy from the side hits you, well, you didn't see that one coming. And then you cry out, well, that's not fair. Remember, I told you a story about fair. Ain't no rules in fighting, is there, Ben? Except I want to be the last one standing or crawling off, whichever way it is, right? I want to be the last one mobile. Listen, God tells you to put on your righteousness, put on your vest. Stay in right communication with God. Stay, stay prayed up. Stay cleaned up. Well, preacher, I've sinned. You don't know. Listen, I don't want to know. Because if I knew, I'd talk about it. I promise. I got a shirt that says it. Anything that you tell me will be used in a sermon someday. So I don't want to know about your sin life. But God says that if you're faithful to repent, faithful to accept the, the punishment, faithful to come to God and say, hey, God, I've sinned, he is faithful and just to forgive you, to dust you off. Anyone ever had a kid go astray, like do something stupid? Yeah, like I don't even know where my, my kid is right now. Listen, Rawson did something stupid. He did. He, he was stupid. I'm not going to tell you what stupid he did. Some of you guys know, but I'm not going to tell everybody, right? He did something stupid. Did he quit being my kid? No. Still love him. I just safeguard some areas now. Listen, God still loves you if you're his child. He just wants you to come to him and say, hey, Dad, yep, I did this. And he's going to say, yeah, I know. I know, I'm just waiting on you to come admit it to me. Like my mom, when I was in high school, knew everything I ever did. And Adam, I did lots of things. Like I had a list. I went back 25 years after out of high school, and we're all sitting around, me and some of my brothers, and we're talking about things we did. My mom's sitting over about where Nene is, and we're talking. I mean, we're all adults. We ain't afraid of her. We're talking about things we did. And we're like, shh, mom doesn't know about that one. She squawks out, yeah, I know about that. I knew you did such and such, such and such. God's that way. He already knows what you did. He just wants you to come clean. He just wants you to come to him and say, hey, dad, I messed up. And he is faithful and just to forgive you and put you right back where you're supposed to be. And listen, if you're out there in a fight and you ain't got your your breastplate of righteousness on, you're, you're, you're not wearing your vest, you need to spend some time getting right with God. 
Get yourself straightened out so that the vest can fortify you against the attacks of the enemy. Listen, when you're not walking in righteousness, it's really easy to screw up. It's really easy to get wrong. When you're not walking in righteousness, you'll look more than once. Remember we talked about that. First looks free. It's when you look again with lust that you've committed adultery. And if you're not walking in righteousness, you'll do that. You know what? If you're not walking in righteousness when someone angers you, right, when they piss you off, you're going to look at them and you're just going to keep dwelling and bitterness is going to come. And you know what happens after bitterness? Sin. Because did you know the Bible says, I know back to the Bible, Jesus said that if you hate somebody, you've committed murder. Hmm. When you're walking with God and you're, you're fessing up, you're getting cleaned up, it's hard not to get forgiven up over stuff like that. It doesn't build up. Guys, this is probably, if not the most important, one of the most important principles here is that if you're not in right standing with God, it's very easy for the enemy to get you. It's very easy for him to wage war on you. When you're not walking in righteousness with God, when your breastplate of righteousness is not on, the war comes at you. Number three, the shoes of the gospel of peace. I don't, they may be Crocs. You know, back in Roman times, they wore sandals. The Roman soldiers, they wore sandals with spikes driven through them. So they had great footing, cleats, if you will. They were there because they knew the hill they had to take. Or something that if they lost their footing and fell, well, it was over, right? If you're in a sword fight and you lose your footing and you hit the ground and the guy with the sword is above you, makes sense? I mean, so we're to have the, go the, the gospel of peace as shoes upon our feet. We're to be prepared everywhere we go to give a defense of the gospel, What's the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the fact that you were a sinner and I'm a sinner, and God sent his son to die for me and you. Do you know how many people don't know that? Do you know how many people believe that salvation somehow is a, a work that they perform? I saw on Facebook again, there's Facebook, I saw on Facebook again that someone thought salvation had something to do with baptism. That's like the easiest myth to dispel, right? Because if salvation, if you had to be baptized to be saved, then Jesus lied to the thief on the cross, and the Bible says God cannot lie. God didn't stop time, pull the thief down, baptize him in the name of the Father, me, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't do that. Some of you guys will catch that later. He didn't do that. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is peace for us to know the gospel. Because of Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ and the peace that he brought in reconciling us, restoring us back to the Father, we can have peace in all situations. Like, we should never be freaking out as Christians. The stock market fell. Who cares? Well, the pandemic, they're saying it's on the rise again. Who cares? Listen, I say it flippantly, but I mean it. If you're saved, you should have the peace of God inside you, and nothing that happens around here should bother you. Grandma Jean, I talk about her a lot, right? Grandma Jean was a lady in the, in the nursing home. Grandma Jean went through all kinds of stuff in her, like, 96 years of life. She went through stuff. She grew up around Jacksonville, Florida. They had no electric, no water. She was one of nine. There were times that they had no food. But at 12 years old, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Shortly after that, her dad died. Several years after that, the guy that she thought she would marry forever, right, took off and joined the military, shipped over to France. So she thought, well, he's gone. She wound up getting married to some other guy. 
That guy beat her. She wound up divorcing that guy all in the span of about six months. Then got a telegram, right? Some of us don't even know what a tele. Some of us don't even know what a telephone is, much less a telegram, right? Tell the church. <laughs> so she got a telegram telling her that this boy that she thought she would marry had been wounded in the war. And he was in Pittsburgh in the military hospital. And so she talked to her mom, and her mom thought it would be okay if, if she caught a train and went from Jacksonville, Florida, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to go pick him up and help him back down to his mom, right, in the Jacksonville area. So off she went. She walks into the hospital room. She's looking for him. I mean, there's beds everywhere. Looking, she doesn't see him. Doesn't see him anywhere. There's this guy closest to her, but he's all wrapped in a bandage all around his head. You can't tell who he is, right? So she just, for whatever reason, says, hey, do you know where I can find Buddy McCormick? And he says, Gene, is that you? The guy she thought she'd married been shot in the face in the Battle of the Bulge. So here is Buddy, who she thought she would marry and have kids with and spend her entire life with. 18 years old, he has no sight. None. Like they blew his eyes out. Gone. She didn't freak out, though. She just, I, I remember her telling me the story. She said, I just figured this was God's plan for our life. So they discharged Buddy. They got back on a train. They made a pit stop in Charleston, South Carolina. I've never been to Charleston. I might go. They made a pit stop in Charleston, South Carolina, and they got married. On the way back on the train, right? They got married, showed back up in Jacksonville, and they told their parents. Their parents were excited. The mom was a little bit worried. Well, what, what's he going to do to take care of you? And Gene said, I don't know. God's got a plan. God's got a plan. Fast forward 70 years later. 70 years. Buddy's laying in a nursing home in agonizing pain. No pain medicine ever. Thanking God that he was provided the opportunity to go through the pain for him. I mean, that's, I get a toothache and I'm crying. Jean, her husband of 70 years, has gone through college. She had to read all the books for him. He was a pastor for years. They had a radio broadcast. Did all this stuff. She's in a nursing home now about to lose her sight. Like she's reading her little daily bread devotions. You guys know what those are, right? She reads those underneath a magnifying glass on a 50-inch TV. That's how she's able to see, okay? And you know what she just kept telling me? God's got a plan. He sent you here. He's got a plan. Christians should be such at peace because of the gospel that no matter what happens around us, we should be able to say, God's got a plan. It's okay. Did you know nothing new has ever happened in heaven? God's never said, oh, oh, oops, I didn't see that one coming. He's got it all. And we should be at such peace no matter what happens because of the gospel of peace because of the gospel that we have that resides inside of us. All right, I got to hurry because I got nine minutes. The Methodists done beat us, so we're, we're trying to beat the Presbyterians, right? Number four, some of you guys are Methodist or Presbyterian. You took offense to that. Get over it. Number four, the shield of faith. I, when I think of this, the shield of faith, I always think of uh, Captain America. Right? I mean, I just, I don't know why. I just do. Captain America had this fancy shield, and that shield seemed to stop everything. Didn't matter what it was, it could stop it. Right? I mean, he threw it over a bomb, jumped on the shield, the bomb blew up, he was good, everyone else was fine. They're shooting this thing with big old M60s. But he's good. Thanos hit it, he was good, until he snapped his fingers. I mean, Captain America, his shield was everything, right? And your shield of faith should be everything for you. 
You should have such faith in Jesus Christ that no matter what happens, you know he's got you. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, hey, even though this is bad, God wouldn't have let me go into this if he didn't have a plan. Did you know storms aren't forever? Storms aren't forever. They come and go. Some storms last longer, but that, like, what was it, last week? We had that rainstorm that came in. I mean, it was like, whoosh, all this rain dropped, wind blew, then it was gone. Sun came out. Listen, our shield of faith should be so great that any time we begin to have anxiety, any time depression begins, any time something bad happens, we should know we can call upon the Lord. And he is faithful and just to hear our prayers and to answer our prayers. Well, preacher, he, he didn't answer my prayer. I prayed for this and it didn't happen. No, he answered. He just told you no. Because he had a reason for it. Listen, I think Christians, I think the church, this is the area that Satan attacks us the greatest. Because we always believe that God, we have faith that God can save us, but sometimes we struggle with the faith that God can protect us. Sometimes we struggle with the faith that God can provide for us. And when the enemy attacks, we should have faith that God's got this. It's no big deal. He's, he's under he, he's got this under control. He's sovereign. He's seen the beginning from the end. He knows what's going to happen to Jordan when she turns 20. Right? He already knows. He's put everything into play. He knows how it's going to play out. You know what this really becomes? When we really walk around with the shield of faith and we're, we're calling upon God upon everything, it becomes dependent living. We're dependent upon God for everything. No matter what happens, if God doesn't show up, we're in trouble. And listen, that's where we need to be. It's where the early church was. When God was showing up and showing out, the early church was dependent upon God. They didn't have what we have. You know, Christianity and the rest of the world, they're dependent upon God. We're dependent upon us. We're dependent upon our air conditioning, our electric, preachers, the fact that we... I mean, the Bible is the number one selling book in all the world, and most households have at least three of them sitting around. I said most. Mine are in my office, not my house. It, when we carry the shield of faith, we take it from us living to dependent living. We're dependent upon God. How many of you can honestly say, honestly, and you don't even raise your hands, in your hearts, how many of you can honestly say that I'm dependent upon God for everything? Even, let's make it easy, right? I'll help you out. I'm dependent upon God for 50% of everything. See, most of us, and I'm no different. Most of us get in the mindset, I'd have a hard conversation with a friend a couple weeks ago. Right? Because I thought I needed to make more money and God thought otherwise. And I, had, I called him because God had been speaking to me, but God had been speaking to him too. So when we had this conversation, it was very easy for both of us. But it was part of that shield of faith, having to be dependent upon God and not dependent upon myself. Men... You struggle with this. Guys, you struggle with this. Because we're, we're the providers, right? We're, my, my wife's forever saying that she'll pay for this. Sean, she hangs around you. She says she'll pay for this. Then she'll say, can I have, my, can I have your card? We're, we're providers, so we feel like we have to do everything. We want to provide. We want to do everything. We want to help them not have to worry about it. So we, we struggle with being dependent upon God to do things for us. I'm not saying you get to sit sour and soak and not do anything. Just wait on God. He's not a genie in a bottle. Okay, God expects you to do. 
right? When he said go, he expects you to get up and go. He'll show you where you're going once you go. God will take care of the details. But our shield of faith matters in the war because we have to be dependent upon God to fight this battle for us. Hang on, I'm going to show you something in just a second. I got two minutes. I got, oh yeah, you're going to be late. I got a couple things. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Listen, you're going out to war. You're in war. You need to have a helmet on. If you're out there fighting the enemy and you ain't even saved, you got a problem. It's not to say that you can't do it though, right? Remember Matthew chapter 7? There's a great multitude that comes to Jesus and says, hey, didn't I feed people? Didn't I water people? Didn't I do this? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And Jesus says to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It's possible to do things in the name of Jesus and not know Jesus. Like you can think you know Jesus, but until you know Jesus, you don't know Jesus. It's, it's possible. The question is, do you have salvation? When you step in out, I, I don't wear hats. We got any hat wearers? Like every, Rick wears a hat. Almost every time I ever see Rick, he got a hat on. Like I didn't even know Rick had hair. <laughs> then there's some of you I've seen in hats, and when you took your hat off, I wasn't sure who you were. Right? Because you ain't got no hair. I, I'm not a hat wearer. I've got hats, but I don't wear hats. I'm just not a hat wearer. My kids, some of my boys like hats. You never see Rylan without a hat. He's always got a hat on. Right? Canaan puts a hat on sometimes. I'm not a hat guy, but the one hat that I make sure that I wear every day is that of salvation. You couldn't convince me that I'm not saved. Listen, I'm just as sure in heaven today, right now, as I will be when I take my final breath on earth. I know heaven is my home. I can screw up, mess up, and I do, but I know that Jesus forgives me. And when he washed me white as snow the first time, and he wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life in his blood, he didn't stand up there with holy white out to blotch it back out when I screwed up. I know that salvation is eternal once you really get it. Do you? Do you know that you are secure in Christ no matter what you do? Do you know that? Like, you wouldn't let me talk you out of your salvation. I can talk. I mean, do you know that you're secure in Christ? No matter what. Because listen, the enemy will do everything he can to convince you otherwise. I, I've got a great friend. He's a great friend, a pastor friend of mine. He doesn't believe in eternal salvation. I say, well, show me in the Bible, right? I mean, I'm just, let's be easy. I'm not going to argue and fight. It's not my theology and your theology. Just show me in the Bible. So he, he goes to some places, and it doesn't really show me. And then I just go to this. Jesus said, all those that the Father has given me, right, because you can't come to salvation unless the Holy Spirit draws you, right? All of those that the Father has given me have lost none. I've got you. And then I go to the practical side of things, right, ladies? You ever got, had to get blood out of clothes? It's pretty hard, ain't it? Let me cut your finger and put blood in paper, and then you try to get that out. Can't do it. Now, I understand God's God. God can do anything he wants. But I think when he said he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, in the blood of his son, he wanted us to understand the practicality of it. So if you take blood and put it even on your Bible that you're sitting there holding right now, and then try to get that blood out of that paper. It's an impossibility. Can't get it out. I don't believe God is up there with holy white out, whiting your name out every time you screw up. E salvation is eternal. There has to be security in your salvation. Now, Paul says this, to check your salvation daily to make sure that what you think you got, you really got. Right? Right? Because some of us, I don't know about you, but some of us have made false professions of salvation, right? We said what we had to. We said a prayer. We got dunked because we were trying to accomplish something. You know how you know you're really saved? 
Because you give Jesus everything. He's got your whole life. He's got it all. And you need that helmet of salvation when you're in war because you need to know that you are secure. You need to know that the enemy can't talk you out of it. Because, listen, if he can talk you out of it, you never had it. I do marriage counseling sometimes. I tell people that I'm probably not the best marriage counselor, but I I do do marriage counseling sometimes. And let me be honest, my job in marriage counseling is to talk people out of getting married. That's what I do. I mean, I start to tell horror stories, my horror stories, right? I don't use any of yours. Well, some of you I do, but not all of you. Um, I start to share horror stories of marriage and how bad it really is and how right now the honeymoon is great and yada, yada, yada. But when you get home, he's going to leave his socks where he wants to. And you can deal with it. You can deal with it. Tell her, Joe. Chicken. <laughs> listen, I, I tell people, I mean, I, I'm, listen, I'm telling people horror stories. I tell people about my mother-in-law. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> that, that, there's one person in here that knew that one. I tell people about her because I was warned about her before I ever got in. And I tell people all about it. And, hey, your mother-in-law is going to invade your space. And that's what some of you guys got great mother-in-laws, and I applaud you. I don't know how, but some of you guys that shouldn't have had a good mother-in-law got one. We ain't talking about John. Um, But, listen, I, I tell all the horror stories because if I can talk them out of getting married, they should have never been there to get married to begin with. If Satan can talk you out of your salvation then you never had it to begin with. If he can talk you out of it, and he'll do it. Listen, he's, he's a wordsmith. He can put them together. He'll put doubt in your mind. If he can talk you out of it, he'll do it. And listen, if he can talk you out of it, you know the best place to shoot somebody you're trying to take them out right away? Right in the head. Headshot. You know what happens when you don't have your helmet of salvation on? Headshot. Because we have heart problems. But you know what the, the window to the heart is? The window to the soul is? It's your eyes. You know where your eyes are located? On your head. These kids aren't real smart. He said, your brain. I don't know whose kids these are. Uh, all right, here's the best one. Number six. And we're done. Let me skip everything else. Number six, the sword of the spirit. You know, soldiers, when they went to war, they had one weapon and one weapon only. It was a sword. You know, most Christians go out and they get involved in this war and ain't got no weapons. They ain't got no switchblades, no lightsabers, no swords. They ain't got nothing. You ask the average Christian. Now, You ask the average Christian to tell you a Bible verse. They either know John 3.16 or they know Jesus wept. That's all they know. That's all they know. Do you know children obey your parents? Okay, then be quiet. Listen, they, they know Jesus wept or for God so loved the world, which are great. You need to know something. And if that's where you start, that's great. But listen, if you've been a Christian 20 years and you still just know Jesus wept, you got a problem. You got a problem. You need to check your salvation. You should hunger for the word of God. You should want to make sure when you're going to battle, you got some weapons. You should want to know when the enemy starts firing arrows at you, you've got a weapon to fight back with. Because if you ain't got no weapon, he's coming to whip your tail. And make no mistake about it, he's big enough to whip your tail. It's the only offensive weapon you got. Everything else is for protection. Shields, breastplates, helmets, belts. Well, how does a belt protect you? 
If you're running away and your pants fall down, it protects you a lot. You don't want to be known as a guy. Anyways, we're going to go on. <laughs> we're going to move past that. Hebrews 4, verse, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, talks about the Word of God as a two-edged sword. It's the only thing that can cut all the way through. As it comes back out, it's still cutting. It will pierce you to the soul, leaving nothing hidden at all. The Word of God says, right, to hide thy word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. You need to memorize Scripture. I, I applaud John's class because from what I understand, they're memorizing some Scripture. You need it. Now listen, let me back up because some of you guys who've got some memories might think, well, you said one time that we didn't need to know all the Bible, that we didn't have to have all this stuff memorized. Da, 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 da. You said that. I said in context, that you didn't have to know all 1,189 chapters of the Bible and have it all memorized so that you could go out and share your faith with someone about Jesus Christ. That's what I said. You need to have some scripture memorized because when you get on the war, when you're on the battlefield, you need to have a weapon. You ain't got nothing memorized. You should stand out there like this. You can't whip people with a shield. You ain't Captain America. Nothing defeats the devil. Nothing defeats the devil like the word of God. Remember when Jesus was pushed out into the desert, 40 days fast, remember that?